Welcome everyone to counseling the family couple and system. I look forward to this semester. Uh, I guess this summer session. It's kind of going to be a quick, a quick semester. Uh, we'll actually get through all the material in seven weeks, and then that eighth week you'll have some time for your final exam. But overall, welcome. Uh, so in this video, I'm just going to introduce myself, uh, talk about the syllabus, review the syllabus and then go over some of the reading materials for this very first week as we jump in, as you prepare for the first discussion board that's that's this week. Uh, so I'm Kirk Tiemann. I have been teaching with Adam State just since the spring. So the start of January is when I started uh, helping out with some classes. So I'm kind of relatively new here, but I've really enjoyed my time so far. I really enjoy engaging with, with all of you students. So I look forward to another term uh, of working together and learning together. I think this is a, an incredibly uh, impactful course. It, it can hopefully have some personal resonance of, of helping you kind of make sense of your family of origin and how these, these theories kind of might apply to you on a personal level. Obviously, that, that's important to kind of deepen your awareness of your background and family dynamics so that, you know, you can work through some of those uh, challenges if there are challenges. and then. The key goal is to, to, to prepare you to be fully more present with clients uh, and then to help them make sense of the, the, the family couple and system. Uh, so yeah, I think this is a really important class in, in a, the program. Uh, I, I guess a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Idaho. I've spent time in Alaska, living in Alaska, living in Wyoming, living in South America and Paraguay. Uh, and but I'm back here in Idaho at this time. Uh, but yeah, so that's just kind of where I've been located. But I have worked as a career counselor. I was the manager of career counseling. I've done mental health counseling. I've worked with children doing play therapy. I've worked with couples uh, and some some family work as well. So I've kind of, I've kind of dabbled in a lot of areas. I'd say my my where I have most experiences in the career counseling realm, but yeah, definitely like currently I'm doing remote mental health clinic uh, counseling work through a company here in Idaho. So kind of a mixture of the mental health at an individual level and the career counseling work, but all of that is impacted by the family couple and the system. So I think this learning is relevant to any form of counseling that you're going to be engaging in. Uh, so with that being said, I think let's shift over to the review of the syllabus. So I'm going to share my screen here real quick. There we are. Here is the syllabus. So you can access this just in Blackboard uh, on the left hand side going to syllabus and going to the this this document. You can download and have it for yourself. So uh, a few points of information that I want to address. Obviously, a lot of this is pretty standard from a lot of different you know, courses. A lot of the information on the syllabi is pretty similar, uh, just related to just kind of student expectations and everything. But right here, I'm going to stop at some of the assignments. So there's going to be four discussion board postings throughout this, this term. So each one's worth 25 points for a total of 100 points. Uh, how I am structuring it is on Wednesday, you need to post your original response to the questions for the discussion board. And then by Saturday, you need to respond to at least two peers and going beyond just the service level of great work, good job, but just kind of giving, giving more depth of feedback, which seems like, you know, from my previous experience, people are pretty used to and do great there. Uh, but yeah, so at 1159 PM both days. So once again, Wednesday, the original post, Saturday, for the response to peers. And also, you know, making sure that you don't do it all in one day. So like on Wednesday, there might be other peers who have already uh, posted their original post. So you might just want to do, okay, I'll just write my original response and respond to two peers and just be done for the week with the discussion board. The, the goal is to get you engaged at different points too. So you're kind of seeing how the discussion board's progressing. We're actually doing two exams in this course as well. So there's going to be a midterm and a final exam, both worth 100 points each. Basically, if you are reading the textbook, watching these videos, you'll be prepared. Uh, there's also resources on the, the written lecture on Blackboard that will kind of highlight some important uh, definitions and, and key terms that will really help you for the, for the exams as well. In the end, the exams are open book. 
They can be taken up to three times and the highest grade will be accepted. So there's no intention of like raising the anxiety levels about that or anything. The key, the key goal as I point here, it, it's to learn, you know? So if, if you have to take it three times to get the grade you want, that means that you've spent more time to learn. So more time to engage with the material. So I think that's the key point is that you're, you're learning through that process. And there's gonna be one uh, written assignment uh, in, this, in this course. So it's the genogram. So I paused there before saying written because it's also kind of like, it's not just a written course. So a genogram, some of you may know if you've taken the career development course already, uh, basically a genogram is a form of like a family tree or a family diagram that kind of shows uh, the three generations. So from yourself, your parents and your grandparents, as well as, you know, all the extended family as well. Uh, and the relationships, the significant relationships between everyone. So there's a video posted this week that will also go into the genograms a little bit more and we'll have plenty of time, you know, to prepare for that assignment about, a, I think it's about a month or I think it's week five that, that we're doing the, the genogram. I'll verify that down below because we'll be going over the, the schedule. All right. So yeah, so you're going to have to construct or kind of visually create the genogram and then write a max five page reflection uh, and just kind of analysis of your, your family genogram. So there's going to be some things to focus on really what you're looking for. I think this is a good way to describe it here. You're going to briefly describe, describe some of those key family members uh, in your life and in the genogram that you noticed, and then provide an in-depth description of two to three themes. So those major large themes that you've noticed that are playing out in your family of, of origin throughout the generations that are kind of part of your experience as well. So that's going to be the key is describing those two to three core themes. And once again, there's not a lot of uh, requirements beyond just kind of describing those key figures and really exploring in, in a lot of detail those those two to three themes. So we're sharing some brief examples, talking about you know how those themes are playing out through the generation is going to be really important. And then you also turn in the genograph, the visual of it, as well as like a, a legend that shows what the symbols mean that you chose to use, which we'll talk about more as the semester progresses. Okay, standard things here, reading scale, pretty standard. Obviously this course is, you know, we're gonna be talking about personal things. So it's important to maintain that confidentiality. Uh, academic integrity is, you know, I think often goes without saying, but I'm absolutely going to say it that like, you know, plagiarism, I think accidental plagiarism happens more than you might think. So, being very precise of if you're using anyone else's words that you cite that appropriately according to the APA seventh edition. Uh, that's uh, sometimes students are still kind of struggling with how to cite, when to cite, am I paraphrasing enough to where I don't have to put a direct quotation. But a general rule that I strongly encourage you to think about, if you're quoting three or more words from a, from a source, cite it with quotation marks and the appropriate, you know, a full citation based on the seventh uh, edition of the APA manual. Sometimes even two words or even one might need to be quoted if they're really unique terms that are, you know, it's not really found elsewhere. The main thing is that you're just giving uh, credits to whatever source that you're, that you're drawing from. All right, I hope that you're using the campus resources related to accommodations. Uh, there's, you know, student sexual misconduct policy, very important to know about where you can go to turn if you, if you need support. Let's go down to the tentative schedule. So like I said, uh, this is an eight week term, but we're going to be going through the material in seven weeks once again. So you have that last week to really prepare well for that final exam. Uh, so we're, we're covering a lot of ground pretty quickly, you know, so this can be a pretty busy class uh, just with the material and also covering two chapters in a week three, four, and five the next week, so three chapters. Uh, we're gonna be moving moving right along. Uh, but yeah, here's the topics that we're covering and the, as well as the assignments and the due dates. Those will typically, the midterm exam is gonna be due on a Saturday, family genogram is gonna be due on a Saturday. The final exam is gonna be due Friday though because that's the last day of this, of this, this summer term. So just don't kind of get in the flow of depending on Saturday you know, when the final exam is due on Friday. And then I have some tentative uh, rubrics uh, that I'll be building into 
and kind of finalizing with the, the rubrics in Blackboard as well. So that's for the discussion boards as well as the genogram. So there's the, the basics on the, the syllabus. If you have more questions, I'd love to chat with you. You can reach out to me via email, send me a message through Blackboard, uh, or set up a Zoom. I'm, 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 I, I didn't talk about that, but I love meeting with students via Zoom. Like, I hope you take me up on that. I hope it's not just like, oh, you know, if you have questions that you just try to figure it out on your own. I'm sure you can do that, but I'm happy to help. Uh, students this last term took me up on reaching out to me about things, and I, I think it really helped to clarify if there was any confusion, uh, just so that, and then they did much better on the assignments because they really understood and there weren't any question marks for them. Okay, let me jump back to my little guide here. So I just want to finish this video by talking about a little bit of the, the readings for this week. Uh, so chapters one and two from the Gladding, if you hold it up. This is the textbook we have, seventh edition. If you don't have this one, it's important to have the seventh edition. Uh, so chapters one and two will be covered this week, as well as perusing. I won't say you know you need to necessarily read every single word, but looking over the uh, marriage and family counselor code of ethics, and uh, that'll be posted in Blackboard as well. So just a few thoughts about the code of ethics, you know, so we have the ACA code of ethics, but this is actually going to be the International Association for Married Family Counselor code of ethics. And uh, they're, they're linked, the ACA code of ethics with, with this, with the Marriage and Family Counselor uh, code of ethics as well. Uh, there's going to be some subtle differences though. So you might start to read through certain sections that you've had experience reading through with the ACA code of ethics. Like oh, maybe the language is a little bit different. And I think that's important to note that, you know, how do we make sense of two different codes of ethics? If we're working with families, like which do we align with, uh, which hopefully it's not like I pick one over the other. Hopefully it's like, I have more resources to help me in my ethical charge, you know, that I need to be as ethical you know, obviously following ethical principles. So they both kind of help in that in collaboration. Uh, even in the Marriage and Family Counselor Code of Ethics, though, it kind of, it references back to the ACA Code of Ethics saying, you know, that we need to be referencing back to that code. So uh, I kind of see the American Counseling Association Code of Ethics as the core, and then the Marriage and Family Counselor is kind of a, an important supplement and an additional guide specifically for working with families, couples, and systems. Uh, yeah, in the end though, I think it's important to note that being in a KCREP accredited program, which you are, uh, there's kind of the, this expectation that you have been provided with this background to, to get started in working with families, couples, and systems, even if you don't necessarily have that as your key goal. But uh, you your license upon licensure you know assuming that you choose to get licensed uh is to prepare you to, to be that generalist there will be families that kind of how to engage with multiple people how to see the client not just as a separate individual clients but the family as a whole it's the family clients which we'll talk about in a second so yeah just a few thoughts there on the code of ethics but i'm going to jump over to the gladding text now for a few thoughts on chapter one and two uh, I don't want to cover, make these videos too long, so I'm going to go through this uh, pretty quickly, but just some key highlights for chapter one. Uh, like I was just talking about, I think an important shift that everyone needs to go through is how do I shift my lens from looking at, you know, an individual is the client, there's one person that I'm working with, to the family is the client. So I don't have, like, if I'm working with a family of three individuals, it's not, oh, I have three different clients. It's they collectively are my client. So I, that, that's the shift that you start to, to experience in these first two chapters is like kind of how to have that mindset, that paradigm shift of, okay, so how do I work with a system? Uh, and, you know, so in... I forgot to write down the exact page, but it, there's in chapter one, it talks about systems theory and systems theory as here, uh, it's a set of elements standing in interaction with one another. Each element in the, in the system is affected by whatever happens to any other element. You know, so that's this, this idea that like if one person is experiencing some difficulties or challenges, the other, like going back to the example of three individuals, those other two are going to be impacted by that. It's almost like if, if, if 
they were hold, all holding a rope, each three of these people in a triangle. If one person starts to move away, it's going to pull and tug on the others. You know, so that's this idea of systems is that we can't act in isolation. Everything we do as an individual is a part of that collective whole, that collective system. Uh, so yeah, through the readings, it'll start to kind of give some examples and some ideas of how to make that shift, how to view from a systemic lens what's occurring for, for clients. Uh, okay, let's see here. Oh, on page seven of the gliding text is, a, is I think, a pretty good uh, reflection. So there's going to be these little family reflections that are... Uh, let me just go to page seven really quick. Yeah, so they're kind of like grayed out a little bit, but I think it talks about the double bind theory for this family reflection. And it asks you to, often these family reflections are asking you to kind of make sense of, okay, so how does the material that I've just been reading about apply to potentially my family? How do I, how might I have seen this in my experience or the experience of others that I've seen around me? So there's gonna be that consistent shift back to, okay, making sense of how, I've, how this, these principles have showed up in my lived experience uh, once again, that's essential. You know, if we don't have that self-awareness as counselors, then our bias, biases or our experiences may surface in the counseling relationship in a negative manner, where it's impacting, you know, the clients in a negative way. Uh, so, yeah, just look out for those, those family reflections. I think they're pretty helpful. So shifting to chapter two, pull up here, starts to talk about... Uh, so I guess the, the title is the theoretical context of, of family therapy. So talk about, you know, what are family? So I'd ask you to think about that for yourself. I think that's a term we use all the time. You know, what is a family? What is family? And that can mean different things. I think a lot of times the go-to is that's biological, you know, connection to individuals. But a lot of times family is much more than just a biological connection for a lot of people. It could be a psychological connection. So there's not even necessarily blood uh, relationships but they're just these these tight-knit bonds that maybe started as friendship but moved to like a, a really deep uh, connection with people so there's that psychological connection as a form of family so anyways they, in the text they kind of talk about a few ideas of, of family and how to kind of view family i think another way of making sense of of systems is through the idea of circular causality or feedback loops you know, so sometimes we think in a linear fashion that, you know, A caused B. So sometimes if you're working individually with a client, the client will be talking about, oh, this person did this to me. So they're, they caused me to feel this way. You know, so that's like an, a linear, you know, way of looking at dynamics that, okay, this person did this and I felt this way. So they are the cause of me feeling this way. Uh, circular causality and feedback loops has to basically, it's, it's a shift of saying, you know, A and B affect each other. On page actually 366 of the text, the gliding text, it references back to circular causality way later, but it talks about that, you know, A and B each affect each other. So it's not like A is doing this to B, you know, A does something that affects B, so then B does something and then that affects A. So there's just kind of constant dance, this constant interaction in the system that if, once again, if there's a shift in one piece of of the system then there's going to be reverberations of that change in other in other spaces so in in this class we're going to get into the specifics again i'm kind of talking abstract right here about these these theoretical principles uh, but yeah i think uh, we'll start to get into some of the nuances of, of examples of that in the text as well let's see here so I don't know if everyone has taken the lifespan development course, but uh, chapter two talks a little bit about that of you know individual development, like this Ericksonian, Eric Erickson model of, of lifespan development. And kind of the fundamental idea behind that is that we're always, you know, that humans are creatures who are trying to grow and progress and develop, that we have this natural inclination to grow and develop into you know, higher functioning beings. And you know, there's a family life cycle as well that's talked about in the chapter of, you know, kind of how our families, maybe there's separate individuals who then come together and they, they can, so that's the kind of the formation of a, of a new family or system unit. Uh, if they have, choose to have children, then that's, you know, they start to have children that like kind of branches out the, the family life cycle into, you know, having people at home, then having teenagers and then have launching uh, children out into the world and then kind of the empty nesting, the retirement years. 
So there's kind of a, a similarity between this individual progression and the family progression, the, the natural life cycle. Obviously, there's multicultural influences that there's not one way, obviously, of, of developing or the family life cycle that looks very different depending on the culture back, cultural background of, of different groups and systems. But the core that I appreciated from the text is that families are ever progressing and trying to grow and develop as well. So really, when family counseling becomes necessary, it's because there's blocks to that growth and development. Something is impacting this natural growth and development that, that the, the system's trying to experience, or that there's you know, some, some patterns that have kept families or systems stuck in the mud. Uh, so that's where family counseling can try to be like the jolt out of that pattern, the jolt into you know, next stages of growth and development. And lastly, what I'll touch on is just the, the counselor and family client relationship. So on page 49, it talks about that. Uh, yeah, so it says uh, matching the life cycles between the family and the counselor. Uh, that's, that's one of the sections there. And it's often going to refer to like marriage and family therapists. I'm going to use the language counselors. Uh, throughout this class, so just just so you notice that that difference and, and shift. I just wanted to highlight page forty nine because this section it kind of talks about like what do you do if maybe you're younger than the family, like than the the parents or partners in the family. So maybe they have children and you're maybe not married or don't have children. So it's like how do I connect? How do I impact the client when I'm in a very different life stage? Or the opposite, maybe you have kids or you've already had kids leave the home. And, you know, the family's like in has lots of little kids or kids in the teenage years, like you might kind of feel like, oh, it's been a while since then. So I guess, you know, some of the questions like, does the counselor have to have this similar experience? Like maybe similar experience can help sometimes, like maybe it is helpful at times. Like, so how might it be helpful to have a similar experience? Also, at the same time, how might it limit the relationship to have a similar experience? You know, sometimes when we have a similar experience with clients, we might feel like, oh, oh okay, yeah, I get it. Uh, but, you know, making that, that mental leap to getting it when, you know, it's a unique family system, it's not your family system. So I think we, we often have to check ourselves, which once again is the big push for the, the personal reflection in this class in particular to notice your family dynamics so that they're not imposed or assumed on others. Okay, well, that's a, a first little, I guess, dip into this material uh, for this for this week but I look forward to the discussion board I look forward to this semester learning from all of you and I, I hope that you reach out to me with questions with concerns with you know wanting to meet via zoom I think that's that's usually the, a great way to kind of connect and get to know each other a little bit more so look forward to the semester and thanks.